welcome 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 hi everyone come on in come on in um if you don't already know my name is akasha divine and i am here to teach you guys about yonism and right now we're um i'm actually finishing up a series this is part three of the imaging implement implementation of the black woman is god philosophy so in this video um we're going to discuss who is our deity okay so in a lot of you know i want to share um a book with you guys today you know i love reading books so i'm going to share a book with you guys today um and if you want, maybe we, you can DM me if you want access to the book, um, things like that. I can share the PDF version with you because that's what I have. I have a PDF version, so I'll be reading that off my phone. But yes, so today this is what we're discussing, and thanks so much for coming. So if you haven't already, go ahead and, um, you know, be sure that if you haven't watched the first parts, part one and two, of this series please do so and you can always watch this afterwards okay because in this video there's going to be context in which we have previously discussed and I don't want you to be like lost okay okay so yes today we're going to be discussing who our deity is and um, you know when you think of any particular uh, faith or religion or whatever you can easily identify what that is, how the people look walking down the street, um, who their deity is, whether it's Jesus Christ or the Buddha or whomever, right? So when it comes to the Black Woman is God, I think we are still in this space where um, we have scholars who have taught us, you know, the scientific and biological, um, you know, reasons as to why the black woman is God, but we haven't gone any further than the logical or left-brained understanding of it. We haven't gone beyond that. So we haven't gone to the cosmic level. And that's what I want to give to you guys. And that's why I'm diving deeper. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I'm going to save this live. I'm going to save it and I'm also going to add it to YouTube. So, um... Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully nothing goes wrong. <laughs> but yes, um, that's what I'm going to do. So don't even worry about it. I know it is the middle of the day and I know um, people are at work. It's Friday. But of course, I wanted to do this on Friday simply because this is the day of the goddess. If you um, have any prior conscious knowledge, um, then you would know that Friday is the day of Venus and Venus is the uh, feminine planet and that's pretty much how it correlates So yes, everyone has their day <laughs> Everyone has the day the Hebrews have the Sabbath, which is a Saturday um, Christians have Sunday, which is supposed to be Saturday, but you know <laughs> And we have Friday so Here I am Okay, so yes, if you see me looking down, I am checking my notes. So, who is our deity? Um, I think it would make sense to just you think the answer would be simple, like okay, it's a black woman. But a lot of times when people are trying to grasp the concept of the black woman being God, they want to immediately think of the worst representations and um, ask, well, is every black woman god right and i think because the understanding of the black woman being god is simply um it hits a cap like there's a level to how far someone will believe this and i've come across this um a couple of times where um you know people or men would say you know the black woman is god but she's not the most high and i'm like what do you, what, i'm confused what do you mean <laughs> what what do you mean i don't understand so because i don't understand um you know i'm sure other people don't understand and it's just like well that doesn't make sense um and i think i've seen it i've seen it as well um i was gifted a book um, I didn't bring I didn't know I was gonna talk about it but um, I was gifted a book called the black goddess um, written by a black man um, I can't remember the title right now but I'll share it I believe I, I shared it before on this page or at least on Facebook or something 
Um, and I was very excited to get it. I was very happy. And then when I was reading it, I realized that it's written from the perspective of um, the nation of Islam. So they still have the concept that Allah is God. So it was a bit confusing. And I don't really know where this... Um, maybe you guys can explain it to me in the comments or you know write to me or something i don't know because i don't understand how you can say um you know something is god but not believe that it's the almighty i don't know i don't know <laughs> i don't know but that's what i want to dive deep into and that's what yonism is it's the understanding that um you know god is everything not like a particular person or being but it's um a consciousness it is a primordial force it is you know more than just what we see here these are our three-dimensional avatars but we are not our consciousness right so we are energy things like that so that's what god is and we want to make sure that you can kind of understand how god can both be a black woman and pure consciousness at the same time which is encompassing um divine feminine and divine masculine energy at the same time okay because i, I because i think people are confused um when they say okay god is a black woman then they say well god has no gender and they think that that's an argument but you're right it doesn't and when we say um god is a black woman we're not saying that god is any one particular thing we're saying God encompasses everything so again I'm gonna dive deeper into that and see you know and hopefully I can um, explain it in a more clear way okay dealing with God being a woman okay so when we think about societies and God being a woman think of all the different depictions of goddesses across society civilizations and in different traditions right um, depending on what you subscribe to or what you have heard of. Um, so do any of these civilizations refer to her as the primordial force, as the creator, right? Or do they just personify a goddess as a consort or wife of a um, higher male god? You know what I'm saying? So which is it? And a lot of times it is she is depicted as a wife, you know? as complementary to a male god but not um you know powerful enough to stand on her own so we're gonna dive deep into that too egypt who is the mother goddess in egypt so again when it comes to uh classes with me um, if you are here live, I personally like to be interactive with you. So if you're if you're here and you're live, then go ahead and be ready to type in the comments um, because I like to interact with you and I like to see where you are and you know how I can proceed forward depending on where you are. Um, but yes, so you know in Egypt we have um, Nu, which is the primordial waters. Um, and have Pachamama for the Andes Mountains. We have, um, thanks. We have uh, a lot for the Islamic faith. So that's pre-Islamic um, as it's called because they took away the T and you know, a T would represent the feminine version of something. So like I said earlier, the, um, a lot of times what they'll do with the goddess is diminish her role and make her a wife of a male version of herself because that's pretty much what they're doing Allah is just um, personified as male but that doesn't mean that he is okay um, and you can um, learn that when you study um, the language so when you study the language um, brother polite actually um expresses that in a more clear manner i did share um that video clip where he goes through the names and what they actually mean um on our page so you can go ahead and go ahead and watch that 
So yeah, so we have Ashira. Ashira, if you ever have heard of Ashira, Ashira is supposed to be from the Hebrew religion that is God's wife or El or Yahweh or, you know, depending on um, what name you're calling the male God. Asherah is the wife of that. And if you go through the Bible, there are verses where you see that there is a battle going on because there were people who decided to worship Asherah and he ain't like that. So, <laughs> so yeah, they got rid of her. <laughs> so yeah, we have Namu for uh, Sumerians, Tiamat for Babylonian, and the list goes on. So, um, and all of these goddesses, um, if you read into them, I chose certain, certain ones based on them being the supreme creator. And, um, and also I don't want to forget, um, Nana Buku. She is, um, of the, um, Yoruban, um, Yoruban people from the Vodun pantheon. Okay. So she is the supreme deity and she birthed twins. Okay. So, Again, when it comes to the mother goddess, you will see that she is most likely the primordial waters, except for Nu, which is the sky, or Newt. But everything begins in a vast abyss of deep water. And that's symbolic of the amniotic fluid when you are in the womb. So are you seeing, you seeing how things are going here? So when you think about black people or people who believe in the black woman be being God um, what name do we have for our deity it's <laughs> a good question right what name do we have for our deity you know how do we personify our mother goddess the great divine mother We don't necessarily have a name for her. Um, so that's why a lot of times we will tend to, being that we are the lost people, we do not know our heritage or we have forgotten or it has been stripped from us. So we tend to <clears throat> dibble and dabble between whether you know we're African or we're native and indigenous to the Americas. So with that, comes us learning um, or adapting to something that essentially feels a little bit foreign to us. Um, so when it comes to us, we as a collective, we do not have um, a specific custom or um, what do you call it? Religious belief of our own that's separate. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing like we create our own culture um being black black of culture we create our own culture here in america um so when it comes to our spirituality we tend to go in different directions and today i want to teach you how it doesn't really matter it does matter but depending on how you receive the information you can end up um you know going the right path anyway depending on your perspective because it's all about what resonates with you okay so i want to be, be very clear that it's understood we must go beyond the simple belief like we must know who the goddess is right we must know who she is um the abstract representation of her isn't enough so just thinking of her as water or the night sky with all the stars birthing the sun the, you know these particular representations they're nice and all you know but they um they do not create a personal connection and a lot of times what we need is a connection with our mother and that's pretty much what we're going to dive into okay so <clears throat> you know the, the reality is no one truly knows who she is, okay? So you see how all the societies have different names for her, and they have different personifications for her, how she looks, her attributes, and things like that. Um, they truly do not have a ultimate manifestation of the cosmic divine, 
okay because again the cosmic divine is um, pure consciousness is inconceivable to our brains because we have not yet tapped into that level of understanding you know what I'm saying um, even in Texas which I'm going to read a little bit today um, we cannot comprehend the actual um, form of the goddess okay so she appears to us in a way in which we will be able to be receptive okay in a way in which is more comfortable to our sight so the same thing is if we think about um, all of the uh, you know beings or creatures that are in the spiritual realm which you end up seeing when you um, do trips or you're on psilocybin or things like that you end up seeing these creatures and sometimes they can appear scary but it's because we have been conditioned to not know what they look like and because we they're not familiar to us we become frightened because we fear the unknown right but at the end of the day like if you think about i was thinking about this yesterday but like think about fairy i was thinking about the fae community the black fae community and you'll notice they look beautiful they have mushroom hats on they have the pointed ears the wings all that look cute and it's all really based on um, animation, um, characters. But if you really think about it, these people may not have actually seen real fairies. And I think when you watch um, True Blood and you see real fairies, even in that show, um, you'll see that when you're in the trance you see fairies looking just like us like normal people no wings no nothing they look like us um but when you go back into the 3d realm out of the fairy realm you go back into the 3d realm and you see them they look scary to you they look like creatures you know what i'm saying you run they're ugly or whatever um and the same goes for a lot of natural um, or nature spirits a lot of you know the beings and creatures that are they surpass this realm they look um, they have distinctive looks that we may not be familiar with to, to the point where we may shun them or run away from them or fear them because we have been conditioned to um, understand beauty in a certain way okay and we see that with each other how we call some some of us beautiful some of us ugly some of us we like some of us we um you know don't like and that's because we have been conditioned to know what beauty is okay and it's, i think it's really funny because even on the news they describe beauty and they try to mathematically map it out with someone's face and i'm like that doesn't even make sense um, but that's what we subscribe to here in this society. That's what we, um, that's what we do. Okay. So, but the truth, the truth is that no one truly knows what the divine looks like. Um, and you have to think about it like, okay, well, how come we don't know? The reason why we don't know is the same way a baby doesn't know what their mother looks like. We are in our mother's womb. In your, in your mother's womb, do you see her face? Do you know her name? No, you don't know these things. So, but you don't you don't know her by these outer attributes. You don't know her by her physical appearance. You don't know her by her her title or what she's called in society. You don't know these things. What you know is how she feels. You know your mother through how she feels. So you feel her. So whenever you feel a spirit, that's your mother. You feel comfort. You feel stability. You feel security. That's your mother. Okay? So if you want to connect with her, the best way to do so is to go into nature. Go into nature because the earth is also a representation of our mother everything you know as above so below so yes go into nature go where the trees are go where the trees are okay whenever your mother gives you a hug that embrace if you want to um, recreate that embrace if you haven't had it or if you haven't had it in a long time okay that's where you can go to get that 
you know, it's been actually proven that if you spend time in nature around trees, um, it will lower your depression. It will lower your anxiety. Okay, it will lower your, your blood pressure. So these things actually give you a sense of security, like everything's going to be okay. It gives you clarity of mind. Okay, a lot of times when you go into nature, that's when you can actually escape from, you know, the matrix that keeps you so occupied. You get a chance to dive deep into yourself. And that's the type of safety and comfort that a mother provides. Okay, so if you want that, go into the trees. Okay, um, if you want to hear her, if you want to hear her, you want to know what she sounds like, go to the ocean. Go to the ocean. Think about when you're in the womb, you're surrounded by water. You're surrounded by water and you hear her breathing. So the push and pull, the rhythm of the waves is her rhythm of breath and the water is what surrounds you. Okay, so that is reminiscent of being in the room. Okay, getting cleansed energetically cleanse okay spiritual cleanse it's most definitely needed okay and if you want to see her you want to see your mother and close your eyes close your eyes and return to that darkness because in the womb it is what <laughs> it is complete darkness understand that the mother is darkness we've been taught that darkness is bad it's bad um, and the light is good but light comes from darkness so we're returning to our ancient knowing okay we're returning to our ancient knowing this is how you can connect with the Divine Mother um, in an energetic way um, and this is again the abstract of connecting with her um there isn't any personification as of yet but i just want to let you know um that's how you can do so if if the abstract worked for you you can do so that way honestly you can do both um but i want to make sure that um i go over that as well I think what's important is our culture and how we grow up because it's not just about us it's also about the next generation and our children so when it comes to um, the word God what's the first image that you think of if someone says thank God what's the first thing you think of or are you in your head fighting off images? <laughs> are you fighting off images like the Caesar Borgia? Are you fighting that off? Are you fighting off um, any male god to think of, excuse me, to think of, you know, a female in your life? I think that would help if I just give you a little bit of an understanding of her actual personification okay and also just what what image do you tell your children because again your children may not be able to grasp the um, the uh, what you call it the abstract um, way of connecting with her right they may they may not but what what picture do you have on your wall like when you go to pray or meditate or chant what image do you have in your home what image will your children grow up seeing i was growing up with <laughs> the black jesus on my wall okay the one with the locks or the one with the locks he was a little bit younger 
not the older one with white woolly hair that the Hebrew Israelites had. I learned about that one later on in life. But growing up, we definitely had a black Jesus on our wall. <laughs> so that was helpful because we didn't have a white man. Um, so it's important that we do have something like that for our children growing up so they can kind of, you know, they can come into, you know, the truth, you know, not just any particular belief or something that may have an agenda attached to it or something that may have, um, you know, bits and pieces of information taken out of it. You know, we don't want to subject our children to that to where they have to grow up um, and like us start all over, erase everything and try to um, dive deep into the rabbit hole to, you know, find answers, you know, answers to the mysteries of life. So we want to be able to teach them um, from young years. Okay, so that's what we want to do. So what I want to do is I want to read a little bit to you. Um, this is actually um, from the book uh, Hindu Goddesses by David R. Kingsley. So I'm getting the book now. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Um, and it's actually on Amazon for about $32. So this is what it looks like. Um, and even on the cover, you see a black woman. Okay, so while this is something that is for another culture, um, their God is black as well. And the reason why I put quotations for another culture is because um, depending on your level of consciousness, you may be at the space um, when you first become consciously aware where you still think that there is separation between peoples. Um, so again, if we are the first on the planet and we birth everybody, then is there really a separation? Think about it. Okay. So, <laughs> so again, this is a book I want to, um, you know, read to you guys. It's called Hindu Goddesses, um, Visions of the Divine Feminine in the Hindu Religious Tradition. Okay. So I'm going to read. So before I begin, um, reading, there are going to be words that you're unfamiliar with and, um, I will do my best to explain what they mean, all the words, and break it down to you. Um, but also, it's because it's from the Sanskrit language, so their names are going to um, represent that um, language and culture. So some some of them I may not pronounce correctly, so I do apologize for anyone who um, is of the Hindu, um, you know, Hindu faith, and I am mispronouncing the name. I am learning the, the proper pronunciations of the letters and words okay so i do want to make that clear and also i am not familiar with every single story but i have come to um dive this way into the hindu religion because again when it comes to different civilizations and traditions that um teach the knowledge of the primordial feminine um, Hindu is the one that actually does, that actually exalts her to the realm of a cosmic deity, not just the first human avatar, which is what I think a lot of um, people believe when they say the black woman is God, that she is just the first human being, oh, she birthed civilization, and that's pretty much it. You know, oh, she has XX chromosomes, oh, oh, this, oh, that, and they're, they're limiting their information to... Um, right here when there's so much more to it um, so that's why I'm here and I'm just going to show you how this is an ancient knowledge okay this is an ancient knowledge um, that we probably will never come across because we still think in separation 
we still think this isn't ours because they may look a little different or they may speak a little different or sound different or whatever. So when we do that, you know, we limit ourselves. We limit our capacity to grow and evolve. So again, um, notice what I do here is I try to bring everything full circle and show you with, um, you know, different cultures how most of us are saying pretty much the same thing and and only tend to differentiate when the male god came into play <laughs> so um yeah that's that's where i'm at um okay so let's see yes page 136 the idea of brahman is another central idea with which the Devi is associated. So Brahman is their ultimate um, creative force, consciousness. Um, so that's what they mean by Brahman, okay? The supreme consciousness, the creation of everything, the universe. So that's what they mean by Brahman. Um, so ever since the time of the Upanishads, Upanishads is basically a religious text that stem from the Vedas. Um, so they have the Vedas, the four Vedas, which is their sacred text. And then they have, um, after that, the Upa Upanishads. And then they also have the Puranas, which the Puranas are mythological um, stories told um, from the um, their biblical characters. Okay, so hopefully you can get a little background on that if you didn't already know okay um so ever since the time of the Upanishads Brahman has been the most commonly accepted term or designation for ultimate reality in Hinduism in the Upanishads and throughout the Hindu tradition Brahman is described in two ways as Nirgana having no qualities or beyond all qualities all qualities and Saguna, okay, having qualities. So Nirgana is having no qualities and Saguna is having qualities. So that's what we've been discussing about abstract versus, um, you know, formed, okay? As Nirguna, which is usually affirmed to the superior way of thinking about Brahman, Ultimate reality transcends all qualities, categories, and limitations. As Nirguna, Brahman transcends all attempts to some circumscribe it. It is beyond all name and form. As the ground of all things, as the fundamental principle of existence, however, Brahman is also spoken of as having qualities, indeed as manifesting itself in a multiplicity of deities, universes, and beings. As Saguna, Brahman reveals itself especially as the various deities of the Hindu pantheon. The main philosophical point asserted in this idea of Saguna, Brahman, is that underlying all the different gods is a unifying essence, namely Brahman. Each individual deity is understood to have a partial manifestation of Brahman, which ultimately is beyond all specifying attributes, functions, and qualities. The idea of Brahman serves well the attempts in many texts devoted to the Devi to affirm her supreme position in the Hindu pan pan pantheon. <clears throat> the idea of Brahman makes two central philosophical points congenial in the theology of the Maha Devi. Okay? Maha meaning great, Devi meaning goddess. Okay? Maha Devi. <clears throat> she is the ultimate reality herself and she is the source of all divine manifestations male and female but especially female as Saguna Brahman the Devi is portrayed as a great cosmic queen enthroned in the highest heaven with a multitude of deities as agents through which she governs the infinite universes in her ultimate essence, however, some texts, despite their clear preference for the Devi's feminine characteristics, 
a certain fashion, a certain traditional fashion that she is beyond all qualities beyond male and female. So, again, yes, while God, the true essence of God, is beyond male and female, um, as the gender, it is male and female, the energy, complete, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> the central role the Debbie plays in mythology is that of creator, queen of the cosmos. When she is portrayed in her own form, um, she is usually described as a beautiful young woman in regal attire surrounded by thousands of attendants and seated on a throne in the highest heaven. As a cosmic queen, she oversees or performs directly the three primary cosmic functions of creation, um, preservation, and destruction. The world is said to be destroyed when she blinks her eyes and to be recreated when she opens her eyes. Remember that last sentence, okay? Remember that. We'll deal with that. Um, but yes, the world is said to be destroyed when she blinks her eyes and to be recreated when she opens her eyes. So those of you who know what that means, type it in the comments. I need to know who knows what that means, okay? I don't want to tell you, but I want to know who has been studying and where you have, um, or what you have learned thus far, okay? So when it comes to the Abrahamic um, male god, what is his role? So they just told you what the Debbie's role is. What is the male god's role? <clears throat> When you think about it, um, in Christianity or, or even in the Hebrew um, faith, their God is where? Sitting on a throne, right? But he's not involved with humanity. He's not involved with his creation, if, the, if this is the truth. He's not involved, um, as far as the Bible is concerned, he's involved as much as giving instruction. So he tells you what to do, and if you don't do it, he punishes you. That's the, that's the pattern that you see in the Bible. If you, if you have not noticed it, even if you haven't read the whole thing, I'm sure you have heard enough stories to be able to put two and two together. Like, okay, um, yeah, he gives, um, you know, instruction, he gives laws, and then if you don't follow those laws, there follows curses or a flood or... You know, just things in which where you will just die. <laughs> so, <laughs> or he'll just destroy your whole village, your whole city, right? So, um, again, this is even reminiscent of, like, everyday life now. So, when it comes to the father, he is the disciplinary. He gives the order in, in the home, right? And the mother is the one who does most of the child rearing. She's the one who wakes you up in the morning, gets you ready for school, take you to school, um, help you with your homework, you know, pick you up, help you with your homework, take you to, um, you know, extracurricular activities. She's the one who nurses you back to health when you skid your knees. She's the one who gives you all your vitamins. She's the one who brushes your hair. She's the one who dresses you. She's the one who, you know, she, she does all these things, right? And you know, the women take on the bulk of the raising of the children, whereas the male, they are there, they are fun, they're either fun or they're disciplinary. Um, so it's just like, it's reminiscent, even in the um, highest of cosmic order, it's the same, you know, mother and father and how they interact with their children. Um, and that's the biggest point. God may not see humanity as his children, but his creations. Whereas Mother God, she sees humanity as her children, not creations. Again, because who taught us that creation happens outside of the body? Who said we were formed from the dust of the ground? 
<laughs> with the hands. Like I'm sure you've seen, um, you know, those pictures with clouds and hands and the man and woman. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure you've seen that as the, as depiction of uh, Genesis and Adam and Eve and things like that. Okay, so someone made you from the dust of the ground or molded you from clay or whatever. But in the mother religion, you are birthed. Something that we see every day but we ignore. We see creation every day. Every day. But we ignore it. It's not, it's only truth, what, here and everywhere else things are different? No, as above, so below. Law of correspondence. That's how you, if you, if you don't know, I tend to do that because if you don't truly know something or you really, you really want to confirm something is true, you just go to the universal laws. The universe has order to it the universe has order to it and it has a divine design so understanding the de design of the universe you can kind of understand what's true and what isn't based on how the universe works okay so let's move on uh so we're moving on to page 138 she herself is also often pictured as taking an active role in the cosmic processes she is ever attentive to the world particularly to her devotees and in various forms she acts to uphold cosmic order and protect her creatures although her concern is that of a mother for her children um, hence a passionate and ever watchful concern her favorite role as protector and preserver is of the cosmos is that of a warrior which is traditionally a male role okay uh, many of her epithets um, empathize this emphasize <laughs> this aspect of her character so again we um, whenever you see um, ancient societies um, the warriors weren't always men. Um, you can see this um, particularly in Africa. And again, it, it is um, displayed for us um, in movies like Black Panther and things like that because I think a lot of people didn't really know about it or they didn't come into the knowledge of it until that movie. And then all of a sudden now everyone is starting to put out knowledge like, yes, this is accurate, this is true, this happens. Um, but yes, absolutely. <clears throat> you know, the woman is the first protector. While men are protected, the woman is the first protector and she gives him she gives him the ability to protect. Okay. The Devi through Nerguna in her ultimate essence assumes for her pleasure a great variety of forms in order to maintain cosmic order. The Mahadevi is said to assume forms appropriate to cosmic threats. Um, the Mahadevi is said to have ten forms. The Das Mahavidyas, okay, the ten great seams or insights. So Das meaning ten, Maha meaning um, great, and Vidyas meaning gods. Okay, so ten great goddesses. That's pretty much what that is. Um, um, these ten forms include several well-known Hindu goddesses and like the Vaishnavite people who um, subscribe to Vi um, Vishnu as their supreme deity, Vaishnavite, um, idea of Avatar, the ten forms of the Devi, effectively bring together distinct strands under a unifying great deity. From the point of view of Devi theology and cosmology, the Hindu goddesses are varying manifestations of the Devi's activity on behalf of the world. Okay. So in the Hindu religion, basically what that's saying is 
um, she takes on many forms. So there's the ultimate reality and then there's many manifestations. And each manifestation has a different purpose or a different role in which or a different activity or characteristic that they'll display so that they can handle a different particular problem, a cosmic threat, or even just to help you personally. Okay, that's why when it comes to um, all the different cultures and things like that, they each have their own image and each have their own name for the goddess that they are subscribing to. So um, that's why even in um, the Egyptian mythology, the pantheon, you will see that there's many different goddesses, okay? Isis, Bastet, Nu, okay, so um, Hathar, there's different ones and they each do something. Some is for, for fertility, some is for, um, you know, crossroads, some is for, um, you know, many different things. Some are for protection. Um, so that's why we have all of that that's pretty much how we um can conceive the divine by seeing her in different aspects it's the same thing as if you were to <clears throat> um that's why a lot of times when you are um, evolving and becoming successful in life you can't take people who were in the lower state with you because they won't be able to see you in a new light they still see you as that person when they knew you back then so it's the same thing um people need a different image for each particular personification if that makes sense <laughs> you know so even when we go back to thinking about okay well what picture you're going to have in your home right who are you going to teach your children about so it goes to show you so you basically can choose an image based off of what it is that you need um so when you want to conceive or you're having trouble conceiving um who are you going to go to when you need that um you can go to somebody like yamaya and i'm sure they have a similar energy in each culture and their own name for her that help with um, women who need to conceive okay so you can have that um, and you can also put that up in your children's room as the protector of children she's the mother goddess and protector of children so that's someone you can put up in your home okay if you um, if you want to deal in the matters of love or you want to manifest um, you know money or things like that if you want to um, have a prosperous business who do you go to then so depending on your perspective or what um, ideology you subscribe to you may say oh well I want to go to Oshun she is um, the one for love she's the one for um, prosperity um, she's the one the goddess of the sweet waters abundance okay um or you can go to lakshmi if you have um studied under bobby hemmett you know that he is a big fan of lakshmi and she's the one who actually have um helped him manifest money so again lakshmi is from the hindu pantheon so again but lakshmi like I said, is a similar energy in different societies. In different societies, it's one energy, but they each have their own name for it. Um, yeah. If you want balance, if you want balance and order in your home, who will you put on your wall? Mayat. So again, there's a different, um, depending on what it is that you need, you can, um, go to the great mother in one of her aspects um depending on what it is that you need and that's what you know her sole purpose would be within those attributes and things that she does so that's that's one thing so it's important to understand that yanism is the ultimate truth so that's why i'm going to um i'm going through different um cultures and bringing to you how they all can, um, uh, what's the word? 
that even from whichever perspective you're coming from, as long as you have the right understanding, you can, that there's truth in all. Like, um, So when people say, well, who is right? I'm going to answer you and say everybody. Um, because there is truth in all. All the facts may not be correct, but there you can find truth in each religion or spiritual faith. And it all comes together under Yanism. Okay? Okay, great. I struggle to get that out. <laughs> yes. So, you know, but what if you don't, um, you know, subscribe to any of the pre-established religions or pantheons? Right? What if you don't subscribe to none of those things and you don't have a name and you don't have an image? Right? So that's what we're going to talk about now. I think what we need... Or what's necessary is for us to have a universal image that we all can um that we all can agree on just like the um the catholic church all agree that Caesar Borgia was Jesus and that image has gone and lasted for generations and everyone has agreed it's on everyone's wall even people where he doesn't even it's it's in Africa okay it's in Africa and people are bowing and everything to it so um I think when it comes to you know the black woman is God we need this and we need this to help legitimize the movement because honestly I think this is the reason why people um, this is the reason why people don't take it seriously and they minimize God to just a person or one of her manifestations to the point where they feel that they can question who she is because one of her manifestations may not be acting in their um, uh, under their standard of godliness which is blasphemy, for lack of a better word. Okay, so. <clears throat> Goddesses are all understood to be parts of a, um, to be parts of, of a transcendent divine economy that is governed by the Devi in her own form or in her aspect as Brahman. This economy, with a few important exceptions, is oriented toward upholding and protecting the world. The Devi also plays the role of protector and preserver in less grand cosmic ways by making periodic and dramatic appearances on behalf of her individual devotees. Um, the Maha Devi then though typically pictured as a distant awesome figure who sits in majesty on a heavenly throne surrounded by divine attendants is responsive to the pleas of her individual devotees and is quick to come in to come to their aid in times of distress she is understood to be an approachable motherly figure who is never who is never deaf to the cries of her children Another important feature of Mahadevi mythology and theology is the insistence that she assumes both benign and terrible forms. Most texts extolling the Devi are preoccupied with her benign and auspicious forms. The many texts affirm that she has several manifestations that are dreadful, dangerous, and bloodthirsty. Remember what I mentioned earlier about, you know how we're conditioned to think what beauty is to point where we're scared of everything else. <laughs> so that's what they're talking about here. Okay. So in the Devi Bhagavata Purana, um, in a passage reminiscent of the scene in the Bhagavad Gita when Arjuna asks to see Krishna's cosmic form, the gods ask the Devi for a glimpse of her universal form. She obliges and the gods are stunned and terrified by what they beheld. She assumes a form having thousands of heads, eyes, and feet. Her entire body blazes with fierce destructive flames and her teeth make horrible grinding noises. 
Her eyes blaze with flames brighter than millions of suns and the gods tremble as they see. As they see her consume the universes, they plead with her to resume her gentle form, which she does, reappearing as a beautiful woman with a soft and gentle body and a smiling face. The Karma Purana describes the Devi who is identified primarily with Parvati as showing her cosmic form to Himavat. She blazes brightly, has dreadful teeth, wears a tiger skin, is armed with many weapons, and is of terrible form. When Himavat trembles with fear <laughs> at her sight, she changes her appearance, presenting herself to him in her beautiful tranquil approachable form the maha nirvana tantra describes her as drenched in blood from grinding up the world at the time of dissolution the next verse says that she protects all beings dispels fear and grants blessings so this is just a peek into what she may look like so she's going to be either beautiful and approachable she'll give you an image that you're comfortable with which is why everyone has um, their own images of what she looks like and usually the goddess of that particular culture fashions those people you understand what I'm saying so you're either gonna have that or you're gonna have her ultimate form which obviously is terrifying okay <laughs> so again what I what I want to do is I want to go through a poem I want to go through a poem hi I want to go through a poem and this poem um so pardon me uh not pronouncing this correctly okay <laughs> um son Daria Lahari, Sundaria Lahari. Um, what I'll do is I'll put the correct um, spelling so you guys can uh, look it up. But yeah, so Sundaria Lahari. So what I did was I actually wrote down the stanzas and what it describes. So in this poem, this is basically a praising of the goddess. Um, um, basically that describes her from head to toe and what she looks like so um, I wanted to share this with you as I think it's um, actually really nice and it gives a clear clear image clear imagery of what she looks like from um, with great detail okay so we're gonna start with actually it's a two-part poem the very first part um, describes her unmanifested form and the second part describes her manifested form so we're gonna get the cosmic form and then the um, the human form okay the one that's recognizable and digestible for us okay so one of the things I wanted to go over because I'm not gonna read the whole thing it is pretty long as you can tell it's pretty long it's a lot of stanzas. Actually, it's a hundred stanzas, not lines, stanzas, okay? We're going to the second part of the poem, which describes um, the physical form, the manifested form. Okay, so it says, here ends the Ananda Lahari, the first part of Sundara Lahari, describing the formless, um, which is Nirakara Urupan, um, which is the formless um, form, <laughs> the formless form, doesn't make sense, um, the bliss absolute, the supreme power, the Adi Shakti. The, follow, the following verses describe the eternal beauty of the mother as the form for worship, Sadara Rupam. Okay, so 
this description of the eternal mother is from top to toe with peerless poetic elegance and figurative beauty which can be experienced only by the one of deep contemplation the poet sankara comes with astounding descriptions of the indescribable almighty may we submit and our heartiest obeisance to this great master okay so beginning with the 42nd stanza okay hi beginning with the 42nd stanza um again what i'll do is I'm going to share this as I put this video on YouTube. I'm going to share the um, the written words so you can read along if you're not someone who can just um, hear or if you don't really like audiobooks or things like that. Of course, I'll have the words on the screen so that you can um, read along as well if you are a visual learner. Okay? So, 42. O oh, the daughter of the snow mountain, O oh mother, whichever poet describes your golden crown, crafted and densely packed with the twelve suns from the twelve galaxies as the gems, will be not composed will he not compose in his poetry that the fragment of the moon decorated on your crown is in itself the rainbow, reflecting the variegated colors due to the luster of the celestial orbs. So in this stanza, he is describing the crown, which is consisting of um, 12 suns from 12 different galaxies. And those are the gems in the crown, um, along with a fragment of the moon. So um, that's so see if you can picture that. And uh, before I continue, one of the things I asked um, my uh, Facebook group to do was, if you could um, imagine the Great Mother, what would she look like? And to draw a picture, even if you're not artistic, it doesn't really matter, but draw a picture of what you think she looks like um, from your mind. Um, and I think that's a, um, a fun exercise. But here, um, if you want, you can take this description and draw this description um, or envision it um, to the best of your ability. So, 43. O Shiva, resembling the cluster of fully bloomed blue lotuses, or the dense blue-black clouds, very soft, silky, fragrant, and glossy, is your hairstyle. Its darkness must annihilate the darkness in our hearts, I think, to steal some of the natural fragrance from your hair, all the divine flowers in the celebrated garden of Indra ever cherished to dwell in your hair. So in this stanza, they are describing her hair. And the adjectives that they use in this stanza is fully bloomed blue lotuses or the dense blue black clouds that are very soft and fragrant. So when you think of clouds, what does that look like to you? you know what does that look like to you deep blue black clouds okay and it's very dark it emphasizes the darkness of it okay and the smell it smells like divine flowers all the divine flowers okay all the divine flowers in the celebrated garden of indra so um if you are familiar with the hindu pantheon you understand that indra is one of their uh top gods so again he would have a garden of um celestial flowers and that's what her hair would smell like so um okay so 44 oh mother the mid partition line in your dense hairstyle simulating a rivulet overflowing from the ocean of your beautiful face is decorated with the cinderam or vermilion powder it is akin to the early morning rays of the sun. This sun appears as if captured by a group of enemies called darkness, which is your dense mass of hair. Let this charm grant us all well-being. So in this stanza, they're talking about the hairstyle. Okay, so obviously it's parted in the middle. 
okay the mid partition line in your dense hairstyle so obviously her hair is dense so listen to the descriptions that's um, being used to describe what she looks like okay um yes of, of course I actually started explaining what Yanism is um, in the first part of this video in the first part of this video which is actually on um, our Instagram right right now so I, I don't want to um, stop and interrupt um, the thought process that's happening at the moment um, but yes you can go ahead and start this video from the beginning this is the second part of the live that I just finished okay so you gotta um, go in order to you know have context of what we're talking about okay so throughout that video and also throughout our page I describe what Yanism is but it is basically a manifestation of the black woman is God philosophy and what we're doing here right now this is the um, this is the series in which I say how we can legitimize that philosophy okay and I'm basically teaching about the black woman being God okay okay so yeah so right now what we are doing is we're reading a poem we're reading a poem that describes the divine manifestation of our mother okay so again the hairstyle that she has so it also says that not only is her she has a middle part in um, her dense hair right she has a middle part in her dense hair and it says it's decorated with vermilion powder so and it is akin to early morning rays of the sun so it should be um, reddish orangey type of color if you are familiar with the um, the Hindu culture you know that they place um, turmeric and things like that in the middle of the part of their hair that is of course um, represent representative of the divine okay the women have that um, so that's pretty much what they're describing here and one of the things that's also in this stanza is um overflowing from the ocean of your beautiful face so the face is described as an ocean okay so pay attention to all the little um, descriptions you have here so darkness which is your dense mass of hair okay Oh mother, your lotus face is covered by your naturally curly hair and thus resembles the beauty of dark bee line swarming a lotus. It is not ridiculing the so-called beauty of any red lotus. Your graceful face is further glorified by your slight smile with the glitter of thy teeth as the glistening lotus filaments. Oh, what to say? Lord Purana Shiva has annihilated Mamata with his looks, but is intoxicated and ever rejoicing with the bee line of his looks in thy fragment lotus face. So in this stanza, you are getting the imagery of her face. Um, and again, here it says, your naturally curly hair. So you're actually getting the texture of her hair. So not only is it dark, um, um, puffy like clouds, blue black, and it's dense, it's also naturally curly. So what does that look like to you? Are we getting Afro-y? Are we feeling, you feeling what I'm saying? Okay, so this is how we prove that all religions come back to the very first female. So every religion is ours depicted in a way in which um, each culture will like to fashion it but it doesn't mean that it's separate from us okay so they're describing an afro right here okay 
and these are things that's hidden from us because it's it's wrapped different it's a gift that's wrapped in different paper so we don't pick it up because we don't like how it's gift wrapped <laughs> okay so it says um by your naturally curly hair and thus resembles the beauty of dark bee lines swarming a lotus so bees you if you recognize how bees fly they don't fly necessarily straight they're swarming especially if they're swarming a flower a lotus flower this is what they're doing so he's talking about the the curls and coils of naturally curly hair okay that's puffy and dense and dark so yes so we have 46 oh mother that forehead of thee shining with pure lustrous beauty appears as one half moon decorated on your crown is the other half of the moon oh here we have the full moon born when we imagine these two halves placed after excuse me placed after reversing and combined mutually with the seam line plastered by Amrita. And I want to, I want to, um, at the end of this, I want to be able to go back to the first, I want to be able to go back to the first part of the poem to read some more of, um, from the formless side descriptions because they speak more about Amrita in the first part of the poem um, while here they focus more on her physical attributes so I want to be able to touch on that um, a little bit later on so forty seven O oh mother Uma Devi the one ever habitu ha habituated to destroying all fear and misery in all the worlds. Your slightly curved eyebrows are like the bow of Manmada. Rati Pati, you, with your jet black beautiful eyes like the bee line string fixed as bow string. This is as if... Manamada has grasped his bow with his left hand and hence the middle part of the bow is hidden by his fist and that of the bow string by his forearm. So they're basically talking about the shape of her eyes using a bow and arrow. Okay, so the bow obviously has a curve, that's the eyebrows, and they're also saying that um, the eyes are jet black okay oh mother thy right eye creates the day being red and fiery of the nature of the sun and thy left eye being cool of the nature of the moon creates the night oh isn't beautiful your third eye well with its luster of a slightly blossomed golden lotus produces the twilight interposed in between the day and the night so you should be seeing day sun moon and the twilight in between okay oh mother what to write the affectionate looks are wide auspicious of of full bloomed beauty unaceable un unassailable by blue water lilies the reservoir of a stream of compassion sweet long protecting they surpass the vast expanse of this country encompassing many cities and deserving them to be named after your compassionate glance having indeed conquered them all so next we have 53 so it says O oh mother the darling of Lord Shiva thy three eyes decorated by beautifying black paste on the lid margins show a combination of three separate colors red white and black 
as if bearing the three gunas, namely Rajas, Satvam, and Tamas, to recreate the Brahma, Vishnu, and Rudra, who have ceased to exist. So this stanza 53 is talking about the makeup in which the goddess has and um, her um, eyeshadow and eyeliner. Okay, so it says beautifying black paste on the lid margins. So that's eyeliner. Show a combination of three separate colors. So red, white, and black. So um, then you have the comparison to the three gunas. So gunas are basically the three qualities of nature so again like i said when it comes to certain words i'll explain them to you so the, the three gunas are the qualities of nature so uh tamas tamas being the darkness or the chaos which is the black color the um the rahas which is the activity or passion so that's the red the red color and then you have sattva which is the beingness and harmony which is white so those are the three qualities of nature which is um, being activity and darkness okay so red white black so those are the three qualities to recreate Brahma, Vishnu, and Rudra. Okay? O Mother, with your heart surrendered to Pasapati, thy looks endowed with kindness are gentle and pleasing. They glorify the three colors, red, white, and deep blue. In these three colors, you bring us this pure confluence of the three holy rivers, the river Sanu, which is red, um, the Ganga, which is white, and the Yamuna, which is deep blue. In order to purify us, this is certain. So I read that simply because I want to um, show how in the Hindu um, pantheon, how they correlate black and deep blue. So when you are thinking of an ocean, what is the color of its depths like the deepest part of the ocean what color does it look like so everyone understands the ocean to be blue but if you go to the depths of it that is the most potency that is the potent potentness of its color of the deepest of its blue right and what does it look like it looks black it's dark down there you can't see a thing <laughs> Okay, I, I mean as far as humans can go, but it is obviously dark to the point where it's black. So even if you've noticed, just like I showed you um, in the first part of this video, um, the on the cover of this book, of the book that I read to you today, Hindu Goddesses, the woman on there is black. And if you um, actually go into history and look at all the imagery of their goddesses, you will see that their skin their complexion is black as in the actual color black not um, brown or things like that and as time goes on she becomes blue and their deities become blue but to them it's pretty much the same um, and then they become white you know what I'm saying so it's the process of whitewashing the deities over time which has happened to a lot of different cultures anyway but only in the Hindu pantheon you see um, blue people. But blue to them is still black. So I just want to put that out there. It's also mentioned in her hair. With her hair being um, a deep blue-black color. But it is, its darkness is deeper than anything. Right? So I just want to put that out there. So... So 55, O oh mother, the, the daughter of the royal mountain, good men assert that the world proceeds to annihilation and creation on the closing and opening of your eyelids. I imagine that your eyes have abandoned closing the eyelids in order to protect from annihilation this entire world born upon opening of your eyelids. So he's basically 
describing the fact that her eyes stay open because how in the world would we exist if you if um if when your eyes close the world dissolves and when your eyes open the world comes into um, existence again so if that is true that means your eyes is always open but technically if you really think about it that's how he's describing it and that's how, pretty much how he's um understanding it but the reality of it is for the divine the days and time is much much longer or doesn't really exist technically so what our time is it's completely minute in comparison to their time so if you have read or heard about brahma um as the supreme deity if you understand how the year works they say one of brahma's days is a complete cycle of the universe um and when he goes to sleep at night is when the world um dissolves and when he wakes up the next day it's a whole different universe and each of his days is if i can remember how many years it is for us 6.3 million I can't remember I can't remember the the um the amount what I'll do is I'll end up putting it in the in the comments below but I can't remember how long they said one day is to the um ultimate divine but basically it basically shows that um a day to the cosmic is basically humanity's entire um you know existence or the universe's entire existence so even before humans even came about um the universe existed the earth existed things like that so we can't even compare so in the poem he thinks that you know god never closes her eyes but she does it's probably the time in which she blinks is the existence of the universe so that's all <laughs> so that's how long it takes um and that's how short our existence is in comparison okay so the next and and again i want you guys to let me know in the comments if you have heard this concept before under a different name so that's what i want you to write in the comments as well so we're moving and again i'm going to be skipping through some of these stances because i want to just focus on the details so the next one we are reading is um 61. O oh mother the icon of the race of the snow mountain where is the doubt that your nose is the treasure is a treasure house of pearls the cool breath flowing out from the nose and the pearl nose and the pearl <laughs> nose ornament outside are they not bearing enough evidence that it the nose contains pearls within let your nose grant me and my people the imminent and appropriate fruits or reward so here he's talking about the nose jewelry which would be pearls so the nose ring would have pearls and her breath is cool okay so next we have 62 oh mother hiding thy beautiful teeth naturally red are thy lips may I dare to give an appropriate comparison if the red coral were to bear fruit that imaginary coral fruit may come nearer in comparison nay nay bimba fruit is no match as its redness is only a vague reflection from thy lips will it not be ashamed to be compared as equivalent how can it enter into a beauty contest so basically her lips are redder than any fruit that that exists Oh mother, the Shakora birds are constantly drinking fully the coolness of your smiling face because it is sweeter than the moonlight. Which 
with this extreme sweetness, their taste sense is blunted a bit, desiring some change in taste and wanting some sour cereal. <laughs> Gruel, therefore, they are now after the moon every night to freely drink the moonlight. So basically, the coolness of her face is like that of the moonlight. So she illuminates. Okay? Oh, mother, your tongue is red of the color of, of the hibiscus, of the hibiscus flower. This is because of your incessant um, japa or prayer enumerating the victorious virtues of thy husband seated on the tip of your tongue. The pu pure, crystalline, brilliant appearance of goddess Saraswati is transformed into a ruby due to the redness of thy tongue. Okay, so her tongue is red as well. 66. O oh mother, goddess Saraswati is singing with the vena the many noble accomplishments of Pasaputi. Then you began to speak gentle words of appropriation. I'm not saying that right. A approbation <laughs> with nodding of your head. Your speech itself is so eloquent and musical that it has put to shame the melodious and sweet tones of Saraswati's Vina. She, to avoid further embarrassment, covers her Vina out of sight with the free end of her sari. So if you know who Saraswati is, Saraswati in the Hindu pantheon is a goddess who is... Um, responsible for bringing knowledge and music so if she's the one who's responsible for bringing music that's why she has a vena which is sort of like um if i can describe it to you is sort of like uh not like a guitar but it's something like that it's a stringed instrument um and again the reason why i don't know the name of it is because there's certain um Asian instruments that have a distinctive sound that is it's unlike the guitar but it's made like the guitar if that makes sense so her music is supposed to be the most beautiful sound because she is the one who gave humanity music so basically what he's describing in this stanza is that the Divine Mother's voice is sweeter in sound than music itself okay 68. O oh mother, the charm of your slender neck region bears the beauty of a lotus stalk, face being the lotus, more so because of the roughness due horripilation whenever Lord Shiva embraces you with his arms around your neck. Excuse me. Below this is the simple necklace of pure innately white pearls but soiled by the copious paste of the black sandal perfume bears the loveliness of the mud stricken lotus root so here of course she's wearing white pearls so but it's soiled with paste of black So that's pretty much how she resembles the beauty of the lotus flower. And I think they keep referring to the lotus um, as a divine representation and symbol of the great goddess because it is beauty that grows um, in the most unlikely of places. So it comes out of the um, basically an environment that's not conducive to any particular um, you know growth of a beautiful flower so it comes out of muddy water um, you know instead of growing in a nicer environment so yes they keep referring to her as lotus and her beauty okay so this is Okay, so we went through sound of voice. 
Okay, 71. Sorry, I almost lost my place. <laughs> 71. Oh, mother, Uma. And what poetic figures, metaphors, one dare describe the charm of thy hands? The red luster of your nails is ridiculing the redness of a freshly blossomed lotus at dawn. Perhaps the lotus may stand a little similarly um, with thy nails, only if it acquires the red dye from the soles of the Sri Lakshmi's feet who rejoices in the lotus. So again, she has red nails. Oh mother, the jewel on the peaks of, of the Himalayas, thy breasts are the precious flask containers of the essence of Amrita. There isn't a trace of doubt in this. If not, why the duo Ganesha and Kartikeya who drink from these breasts ever remain or wish to remain as young boys, unknowing, not cherishing any marital pleasures? So basically, they're talking about her breasts and the, and the milk they're in. So basically, to drink from the breasts, you are getting, um, that is the essence of Amarita. And if you know what Amarita is, Amarita is um, the, it's considered the um, liquid of the gods. It is a uh, youth formula. Um, and basically, it gives men life. So that's why they're referring to um, uh, two people who decide that they want to drink and their desire is to remain young so that they never grow up to um, learn about or enjoy marital pleasures, which is, of course, sexual intercourse. So they prefer to remain young because the milk that comes from the goddess's breast is that delicious. <laughs> it's nourishing and it keeps them young. So now we have 76. O oh, mother, the daughter of the Parvata Raha, when the body of Manmara is engulfed by the furious flaming looks of Lord Hara, he, Cupid, immersed himself in the deep pool of your belly button, navel, to save him from the fury. Thus, when that fire is put off, a tendril of smoke arose from thy navel. Oh, poets think of this, the smoke, as the fine hairline above your navel. Okay, so here they're describing her belly button. And if he is to escape <laughs> escape fires by immersing himself in the deep pool of your belly button it means that the goddess has an any and not an Audi so that he can dive in and obviously she has a um, line of hair that um, arises from her navel as well and that's considered the smoke okay fine hairline above your navel so she's a little bit of hair above her navel Okay, so it's giving you um, very distinctive descriptions. Okay, and it says, Oh, mother, the thin gray black hairline on the midline of your abdomen is apparently like the stream of the river Kalindi, or is it the vast expanse of the blue black sky in between your heavy bosom squeezed down by mutual friction into a steam leading to the pool below the navel? Only the evolved wise men can understand this. Okay. So it's giving you the picture that she has you know hair her navel is deep her breasts are huge okay O 
O mother, the daughter of the mountain, what to say of your navel? Can one say it is the steady whirlpool of River Ganga? Is it the basin part for the thin creeper line of hair with charming flower buds, the breast? Is it the homoguldum hollow for the luster, sacrificial fire of Manmada? Is it the pleasure house of Rati? Or, with the kind looks of Lord Shiva, is it the gateway for all the fulfillments? It is beyond my imagination, be it victorious. Um, 79. <clears throat> oh, the best of all women, the daughter of the mountain, your waist is naturally slim. In addition, it is fatigued and further slimmed by your heavy bosom and hence is slightly bent or curved in shape, simulates a tree on a breached riverbank, threatening to break at any time. Here, the figure of speech hyperbole is used to glorify mother's slender waistline. I ever pray to such a waistline to give stability and perpetual happiness to us. Okay, so her waist is thin, slim. So, 81. O oh, Mother Hervarti, your father, the Lord of the Mountains, presented to you in the form of a wedding gift heavy and vast chunks of his mountain, having cut them from his own flanks. That must be the reason for the heavy and expansive mass of thy hips and loins. They conceal the whole earth and make it appear lighter in comparison to your hips. So, her hips is wider than the earth. Okay, so she has big hips, slim waist, big breast. You know, just putting it into perspective. O oh, mother, the daughter of the mountain, O oh, knower of all Vedic injunctions, you have conquered the beauty of both, namely the trunks of mighty elephants and the stems of the golden plantain trees, by your perfectly cylindrical and smooth thighs. Your knees are well rounded and hard due to prostrations to your husband, Shiva. They are smart in fullness, the frontal globes injures elephant. So now it's describing her thighs and knees. So now we go to uh, 84. O Jagan Mata, thy two feet are adored as the crowns on the peaks. Upanishads of the Vedas. Like I said earlier, Upanishads is derivative from the Vedas. So if the Vedas are here, Upanishads is here. So that's pretty much the comparison that they're making. So the feet is the Upanishads of the Vedas. The water that washes your feet is a celestial river Ganga in the matted hair locks of Lord Pas Pasupati. The luster of the lac dye used on your feet imparts red color to the to the ruby that glorifies the diadem of Sri Hari. Oh mother, please place them on my head too, taking mercy on me. Oh Bhagavati, this is the pair of feet Lord Shiva always desires to walk in tandem with his. He is perhaps envious on the Ahsoka trees in the celestial garden of joy because your feet frequent that place. This pair of feet is brilliant, lustrous with the red lac dye. They are most delightful to the eye. I surrender my ego at this pair of feet, my obeisance to them. So he's talking about the red dye on the feet. And that's something that is also synonymous with a lot of the customs and rituals there. They will adorn the feet of um, young women with red dye and flowers and things like that. Um, I'll be getting into that in another video. Okay.
So, O Bhagavati, thou art the origin of all speech. This hymn praising your glories is done by your own words. This is like the performance of Harati, the ablation of lights, with the flame of a lamp to the sun god, or the performance of Argaram, oblation of sweet juice with cool drops of water from marble stone to the moon, or like performing Tarapanam, oblation of water to the ocean with its own waters. Thou art the whole and part two, I am insignificant. So that's the end of the poem. And that is basically the physical manifestation of the Great Mother. And I just want to give you that imagery. And I like how it was, um, I like how it was described um, and how detailed it was. Okay, so, and again, you may be surprised that who they described outside of the parameters of race, who they described um, has hair that is dense, curly, coily, naturally curly, and um, puffy like clouds. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> so that is the end, but I did at the end, I did want to go back and speak more about Amarita, okay? And that's just my uh, preference. So here, what did I write down? Okay, so... Okay, so I just want to go over a few. I'm not going to go over the whole first part of the poem, but I just want to go over just a few stanzas um, as it relates to... Um, it, it'll just make more sense um, about the concept of Yanism. Okay? So I'm going to end up going to page 12, I believe. So we're going close up to the beginning. Okay, so we're going to speak speak on her beauty. Okay? This is stanza 7. Um let the Divine Mother dwell intimately in our hearts with her tinkling fillet girdle, her full bosom akin to the frontal globes of a young elephant, making her bend forward, reaching us, her lean waist enhancing her beauty, her face akin to the full autumnal moon. She sports in her palms a bow and arrow, a noose and a god. I revere this divine mother who is the eye consciousness in the Lord. Okay. So, yes, she has the beauty of the moon, the luminescence of the moon. Okay. So, I'm going to read... Stanzas 9 and 10, okay? May I understand thee? So he's basically asking, can he understand her? Okay, so you are the earth element in the Mula Adara, the water element, the fire element, okay, um, presented in the inner core of consciousness, the air element in the heart, going above the space element and the mind element in between the eyebrows, the imminent vision. Thus having passed through all of the five um, gross elements and exhausting them in thy path, your, you sport your creative activity in secret with your husband in the thousand-petaled lotus. Listen, they're talking about the creative activity in secret with your husband. So... Again, when you're talking about the creative activity, what creative activity do we do in secret? Behind closed doors. How do we create as humans? 
It's the same way God's great. Okay? So they're talking about um, the goddess and her husband um, creating, having sexual intercourse. Um, the thousand petaled lotus is their bedchamber, if you, if you will. Okay? So, oh mother, you infuse the whole universe with Amarita, drenching it in this torrential stream which trickles from within your pair of feet. Once again, this flow reaches your territory after drenching the moon, who is apparent essence of Amarita. You pervade the earth element in the form of Kundalini Shakti by making yourself into three and a half coils similar to a serpent sleeping in it as exceedingly subtle consciousness. So again, you infuse the whole universe with Amarita. So first, the mother and her husband is um, having sexual intercourse in their creative activity in secret. And now she's infusing the entire universe with Amarita, okay? And you know Amarita is the Yanni juices because it says it trickles from within your pair of feet. So if you were to allow Amarita to flow, where would they fall eventually? <laughs> it would go down the legs in between your feet, okay? So again, you got to be able to uh, read between the lines and see what it is that they're talking about. So these are some things that I wanted to... Um, bring out okay and then we're gonna skip to 18 O oh mother, he who understands that all heaven and earth are ever immersed in the pink luster of thy persona, akin to the luster of the freshly arisen sun, to him how many celestial courtesan maids, along with Urvasi, are not at his feet, with their eyes resembling frightened forest deer. Indeed, all such women are after him. So here, they're talking about... All he who understands that all heaven and earth are ever immersed in the pink luster of thy persona. Okay, so remember that line. Okay, so I'm going to continue. O Queen of Hara, he who meditates on thee as manifestation of the creative force. Having imagined the bintu as thy face, thy bosom as the middle part, and thy female organs of generation below, that signifying you as force of the Leia, he immediately reduces all women into a state of agitation very easily. He even deludes quickly the maiden named Triloki, which means three worlds, who has the sun and moon as her pair of breasts. So... The next stanza, number 19, tells you what that pink persona is, okay? And it's basically, it says here, um, thy female organs of generation below. So, obviously, he's talking about her vagina, her yoni, okay? Um, verse 20. O oh, mother, he who fixes thee in his heart as the scintillation emanating like nectar from the various parts of thy persona. So this is more um, confirmation that they're talking about, um, they're continuously talking about um, her yoni, okay? So he who fixes thee in his heart as the scintillating emanating like nectar from the various parts of thy persona. So the nectar that comes from thy persona is Amarita. Okay, so that's the Yanni juices. Um, like the multitude of cool rays from an idol made up of moonstone marble becomes powerful like Garatanam, the lord of birds, who destroys the pride of serpents. Such a devoted man 
comforts those scorched by fever by his mere look endowed as if he is with the vessel overflowing with amarita so along this particular um poem they are diving into amarita and the power that's within it okay so the universe is really made from the womb the universe is made from the womb okay and what creates the heavens and the earth is amarita And it's um it's said again in verse in stanza I'm saying verse in stanza twenty eight. O mother, the Brahma, Indra, and other celebrities of the heaven, though they have taken the immortal fluid, Amarita, which is supposed to remove the fearful old age and death, perish at the time of Pralaya or total dissolution. But Sambu, though he consumed the dreadful poison, is not affected even the least by the all devouring time isn't it because of the greatness of your earrings so right here is where they talk about how amarita can give you um it can op obviously give you health so even drinking poison you won't be affected by it um the only way you'll die is at the time of total dissolution which is the end of the universe which is when the goddess closes her eyes okay okay so yeah that's pretty much about it um the rest is more about worship and things like that so i pretty much just um you know wrote down what each um stanza is about and if you want to dive deeper into this or you want me to um, go over it with you, um, you know, or dive deeper into it, or you want to read more um, stories because there's actually more. Um, there's another book where it's more so on the mythology of the goddess. And I want to get into those stories and how her stories, her mythology helps you become better and, and the reason why i want to do that is because when you're reading the bible especially if you're coming from the bible the um the holy bible the hebrew bible the thing that stands out to me is the story of adam and eve and how eve ate the apple or how his instruction was not to eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil right but Eve eats of it and now he's upset but once they eat of it now they are like him now they know things that he knows <laughs> you know what I'm saying so now they are enlightened in a way in which he did not want them to be so just as a comparison the male god doesn't want you to be enlightened he'd much rather you be docile to the point where you just follow his instruction and you remain oblivious to the truth of the universe um to who he is to who you are if you're walking around naked or not you know what i'm saying um he wants you to remain oblivious whereas the mother um she wants to help you evolve consciously she wants you to return to her because honestly when you evolve consciously that's when you reunite yourself with the divine mother she's basically saying come here come here come come take my hug i want to embrace you um she's not going to you know like curse you because you ain't listen to her it's, it her um wrath is really for those um who work against cosmic order not if you want to learn something so <laughs> so yes i want to dive into those stories in this mythology because we need better examples of what god is and it's really really crazy because um the god that um the male god that um curses you for not doing what he says is the one that's um called um you know benevolent um, ain't he good all the time you know 
<laughs> that's that's what we say. So yeah, it's really it's really weird. And then when they when it comes to bad things, people say, oh, he works in mysterious ways. Or and then there's the script there's scriptures that say, okay, well, um, your understanding is is not going to be like his understanding. So um, you know, don't question. You know what I'm saying? Um, and basically he basically wants you to be docile it's, it's evident all over the bible you know what i'm saying so <clears throat> you know i just want to show you the differences and things like that so if we're going to know what a loving god is you would know that from your mother god and not necessarily from your father god and that's pretty much what we're going to learn as we dive deeper into um the mother mother god theology okay but thanks thank you guys so much for coming today thanks thanks so much for watching go ahead and type in the comments below um if you have any questions or if you want me to go deeper into any part of that or if you want me to explain more of that poem um just let me know in the comments as well and let me know what you think um also let me know um which style of teaching you like if you like me talking to you this way or if you like um the slideshows and i can set that up as well so you let me know what you prefer okay so thanks so much and remember to love your mothers <laughs> respect your mothers and again it's been lovely